On the mountain is the eternal city of Antiri, the place where there are no secrets. And while the citizens do not smile so much, they hardly frown either. Jewels and objects of great worth lie in the streets, for there is no theft where there are no secrets, and there are no secrets in Antiri. Long ago, during the war of magical technology, the city sheltered a great wizard. And in return for the city's kindness, the wizard enchanted the water of Antiri, such that one need only stare into the reflection of a puddle or wash basin, and ask after a person or place one should like to see, and be shown that thing in its entirety. It's not spying, spying is an exclusive activity, and since anyone can watch anyone, this is simply how the Antirans live. They have no word for secrecy. Life was turbulent at first, the whispered slights of the bathhouse, the swindles of the marketplace suddenly watchable for all, plus crime rings and crooked politicians could be listened in on at a moment's notice, illicit love affairs observed by anyone sufficiently voyeuristic. But the adjustment was made. Recent generations have grown up with no concept of concealment, and do not seem to suffer for it. Everything is visible in the water. Even the most mundane act, the brushing of one's teeth, the brewing of one's tea, is performed with attention and flair for anyone and everyone may be watching. There is nothing hidden. Every eye is all-seeing and all-seen. But Antiri's transparency is not for everyone. And for those who cannot bear such a way of life, Far below, by the ocean, swaddled always in fog, is the eternal city of Tynograd, the place where there are only secrets. The citizens don't frown so much, but they hardly smile either. Possessions are many, and doors are unlocked, since there is no desire unfulfilled in Tynograd, and there is no theft where there is no desire unfulfilled. For it was here, long ago, the great wizard first went for shelter and was refused. And to thank the people of Tynograd for their apathy, he returned to the conclusion of the war and enchanted the water here too. The wet fog that permeates every street and house, the snow that thaws come spring. Though while the water in Tynograd sees all, citizens have no access to its omniscient visions. There is only one watcher. Out of the bedrooms, where glasses on nightstands listen of those mumbled untold secrets the Tynagradians admit in their sleep. Down the cobbled stones, where the puddles watch of land disputes and unrequited love. To the harbour, where the ocean silently records of overpriced fish and drunken bar brawls. Out into the bay, where there resides a great kraken who watches. The kraken never sleeps, never falters, its mind unjudging as a seismograph. And the kraken is very hungry, and its favourite meal is secrets, as delivered by the water to its its unblinking eyes, the secrets of Tynograd, each impulse and desire of each citizen, such that they may be met if favourable to the market, or suppressed if not, such that at the slightest hint of eccentricity citizens may be placed under heightened surveillance, such that none need ever fear or want. And in return for this miracle of constant safety and satisfaction, all the Kraken requires is a little knowledge, and all it wants to know is everything. Give me your tired thoughts, your poor decisions, your huddled missives yearning to be free. Who have you been going to bed with? Who would you like to go to bed with? Thinking of starting a family? Thinking of cutting off your family? Preferred brand of breakfast cereal? Least favourite season? What does home mean to you? And if the miracle should falter for a second, and a citizen might catch sight of a great hungry eye peering from the water, and cry out, these are secrets, my secrets, and my secrets are all I have, the Kraken only replies, you ungrateful little insect, for what pretty thing I have sold you, what peace times I have delivered you, what love I have shown you, what is privacy for? How do we resist the increasingly aggressive attempts to remove it from us? And is this video sponsored by an easy to use and reliable VPN? Fuck no, it is not. If you don't live alone, but get the chance to sometime, I would recommend it, because you can constantly eat junk food without shame, become entirely nocturnal, and discover the true meaning of independent living. Oh yeah, where's your toilet regime now, mum? But living alone is a pretty recent phenomenon. Just sleeping alone is a pretty recent phenomenon, even for the historically rich. Privacy is an invention. We made that shit up. But how do we get here? Well, for the first few hundred thousand years of our time on this watery spaceship, it is unlikely there were many loners. For hunter-gatherers, going it alone probably meant death, because strength in numbers was about the only trick that kept us alive. We were social by necessity, and we didn't do walls yet, so other than the confines of your own mind, how could you have privacy in that social configuration? What was the most, mostest game-changing human invention? Fire, the transistor, all pretty rad, yes? But the wall is going to be up there in the top five at least. 
We've been doing walls for about 23,000 years now, the oldest one we found being in Greece. Of course it's Greece, it's always Greece. And not only do walls signify property, and property is a pretty weird idea if you've never heard of it before, first person to get the land gets the land forever, why? But it also means security, means castles, means established power structures, and it's only so long before walls start to mean privacy. And that was more or less codified, for the first time we know of, by the Greeks, because it's always the Greeks, isn't it? And the distinction between the polis and the oikos. The polis being public life, politics, shit you did outside really, and the oikos, your house, your family life, shit you did inside really. But even then, in most Greek tragedies, the only thing worse than getting executed was being alone, being exiled. Still, our ancestors understood privacy of the mind just fine, as in secrets. The Chinese managed to keep the particulars of silk production a secret for over a thousand years by making you dead if you blab to anyone. Then there was Greek fire, because it's always the fucking Greeks, isn't it? A flammable slime used by the Byzantines during battle. Yeah, that's right, a 7th century flamethrower. And the secret of its composition was so well kept, we still don't really know what the hell it was today. Also, the legend goes that when Genghis Khan died, his funeral escort kept his burial site a secret by murdering anyone they passed on the way there. Bit heavy-handed, but points for execution. Li <laughs> literally. Literally. <laughs> yeah. I long to die. For the next ages, us Europeans at least did pretty much everything under the gaze of someone else while at home, eating, weeping, and sleeping. It's how we built our houses. It wasn't until the 17th century that some genius thought to invent an entire room for the bed. The bedroom, if you will. But beds themselves were crazy expensive. Most homes could only afford a single bed, shared by family and guests, which meant not only did you get to witness your nearest and dearest sleeping, but all the other activities that might occur in a bedroom. And while there wasn't really a concept of medieval privacy either, there were ways to obtain a little alone time, like pissing off the church and getting excommunicated, big fun, or cutting off heads for a living. Working as an executioner was so shameful you wouldn't be invited into others' homes, couldn't enter churches, and had to live on the fringes of town. If privacy is the right to be let alone, then along with monks, executioners were arguably kind of the pioneers of something beginning to sound like modern privacy. But it would take a while yet. In the early 1900s, Abigail Robeson one day noticed a photo of herself on a poster advertising flour. She didn't remember endorsing any flour, so she sued the company in question for using her likeness without her permission. She won the case. However, the defendants appealed, claiming they hadn't taken anything of worth from her, and they won the appeal. The chief judge writing, actually, she should be touched, as the ad was, quote, a compliment to her beauty. Aha. But a pleasant surprise, the public was pissed at the ruling. Maximum pissed, resulting not too long after in the first instance of legislation forbidding using one's likeness without their permission. The beginning of modern privacy, really. Ironically, the chief judge we just mentioned, who ruled against her and said she should be stoked because she was pretty and shut up, would run for president in a few years, and after getting snapped constantly by photographers, waxed at great length about how it was an invasion of his privacy. Abigail Robeson reminded him in a letter in the New York Times, but you said there is no right to privacy. Not so fun when it's being done to you, eh? What a twat. And in just a few decades, Jesus Christo, things are about to get weirder. Because by now, it's the 1960s. Computers are rather massive, trousers are rather silly, and the Cold War is heating up. The US Department of Defense is interested in distributing information across computers in case one link in the chain, let's say, breaks down a bit. Enter ARPANET, the first packet switch network and grandfather of the modern internet. And the first message ever sent over ARPANET, from UCLA to Stanford Research Institute, was supposed to be LOGIN. However, the system fell over after two letters, meaning the internet's first message to the world was LOW. As in, lo and behold, I have arrived, you fucks. First words don't get better than that. By 1971, the first email has been sent. By 1973, the first transatlantic connection is made. Then, by 1978, Robert Kahn and Vince Cerf have designed TCP IP, or Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. And if the internet talks in the language, this is it. By the 90s, Tim Berners-Lee has kindly invented the World Wide Web, the retrieval of information architecture the modern net is built on top of, making possible hypertext, hyperlinks, and the first website. You can still visit it today. And naturally comes the first webcam. It monitors a coffee machine at Cambridge University, for some reason. 1993, the first graphical web browser 
Plaza Mosaic, and then The Moolah. Oh, The Moolah. 1994 and Amazon.com makes his first sales, one of them notably to Bulgaria for some books paid for in cash, which is sent over hidden inside a floppy disk so the customs inspectors won't steal it. Clever as ever, Obichante Bulgaria. Then enter me and perhaps you. 90s internet was pretty weird. A patchwork amalgamation of misfiring search engines, god-awful site design, and if someone had the audacity to phone your house, all they got was the sound of the modem. It was fucking great. But stranger, while most technologists have been expecting a robotics revolution for the end of the century, what we got instead was a communications revolution. Clearly preferable since, yeah, the internet can't fetch your tea, but more importantly, you can't watch pornography on a robot. And really, this is just one idiot's biased nostalgia for a simpler time. But not a few decades ago, the hope for what the internet could do was limitless. Most societal issues surely stemmed from a lack of information, and with all human knowledge at our fingertips, we would all eventually come to the same objective conclusions, emerge from division and ignorance, and draw together in peace as a unified digital family. And that went so-so. Oh yeah, Utopia must be just over the hill now, mate. I can almost see it. Oh no, that's just my dad's OnlyFans account. Hey dad, what a brave new world we've built. Somehow brave new world and 1984 at the exact same time. We were promised the end of history. We were promised ultimate truth. We're supposed to be solving world hunger and building interstellar starships. What is Chungus? I do not understand. What have we done to ourselves? We've broken epistemology itself, sacrificed truth in favor of mediated hyper-reality. And for what? For what? What the fuck is Chungus? Sorry, we were supposed to be talking about privacy, weren't we? Well, we're kind of boned right now, and to talk about that, we'll need a patronizingly simple history of privacy, which we've sort of just done, and some kind of beat, preferably a fat one. Yeah, that'll do. Hey, this is the Panopticon. It's a prison design. A guard tower sits at the center so the guard can see all the inmates in a helpful 360 panorama. The twist is that the prisoners can't see into the tower and so never know when they're being watched, so they may as well assume they're always being watched. The constant implication of surveillance. And what relevance could this have as a modern metaphor? We already know that governments are snooping on our digital lives with impunity. But it's not just states playing that game. We're now knee-deep in a technological moment the thinker Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. Or rather, turning the internet into a data mill for no fun and lots of profit. And it has the potential not just to corrupt the future of the internet, but remove any possibility of digital privacy ever again. In the early 2000s, the dot-com bubble burst. This was a problem for Silicon Valley because no one quite knew how to monetize the internet yet, and that 17th personal yacht ain't just gonna buy itself. Google was clever. They noticed that courtesy of all the searches they were providing, they were sat on a massive buffet of data from and about their users. Lots of that data could be used to optimize Google itself, but a huge amount was left over and incidental, which we may as well call behavioral surplus. This was simple stuff at first, like noticing if a user makes a lot of typos, maybe that means they're in a hurry, or if they're particularly diligent about apostrophes, maybe they're all bookish or whatever. But in a stroke of Walter White levels of cunning, Google realized they could use this leftover information to generate predictive patterns about a user's moods and desires, and create absurdly well-targeted advertising. And great googly moogly! It worked. It made them rich beyond all imagining. And the best part is, it's free. Users gave them their secrets for free in searches. Now, at this point, no one is surprised that if, in a moment of 3.30am whiskey-induced curiosity, one searches, Willy Bigger How? You will be bombarded for the next 15 years with adverts for questionable tonics and small weights on long strings. Kinda weird, kinda annoying, but it's so much more sinister than that. Because as Google branched out into media and email and navigation, the data points for behavioral surplus for its users' secrets grew and grew. The inner lives of Google's users became its primary resource, a fully automated data mill extracting highly specific details of a user's psychology and turning that into big bucks via advertising. And of course, the more data you collect about users, as in the more behavioral surplus you extract, the more behavioral correlations you can find, and the more efficient the game gets. If I know that you're trying to sell a wedding ring and hire a divorce lawyer, then I also know you're probably at that point in your life when some 95% vodka made from deck chairs could sound appealing. Just been for a run? Unrelatedly, check out these amazing shoes. Contemplating turning your life around? Would some 
Deck Chair Vodka Help and other companies soon got in on behavioral surplus too. Because if you throw health trackers and digital thermostats and smart cars into the mix, all of them collecting buckets of personal data, it's possible to build an even more accurate model of your desires, or just sell that information to third parties. One's commute route and heart rate and sleep habits, all helpfully recorded and transmitted by the one object that will probably stay no more than a foot away from our bodies for the rest of our lives. Data one thought was one's own. Data that are being sold on for staggering amounts of money, to the point that it is now an economy in itself. Brokers whose only job is to sell an entire profile of you, what you eat, what conditions you suffer from, voting habits, sexual orientation, your secrets. Your secrets, these obligate fucking carnivores. As Shoshana Zuboff puts it, you take something from someone without their knowledge, claim you own it, and then use it to become unprecedentedly wealthy. Or, you know, theft. Yeah, but is it really theft if it doesn't impact us on a day-to-day -day level? Yes. Yes. Yes! There's a fun adage that if the product is free, then you're the product. But here it's more like you're the raw material, and there's no such thing as too much data to those who want it. Marital status, level of education, feelings regarding a recent game update, all of it is being fed into the system decoding the black box of human desire itself, which is being cross-referenced against ever more honed personality models, not just to advertise, but to scare and seduce in advance, to make that advertising even more effective. BF Skinner shit. Do you know what this is, son? This is the Panopticon, constantly in implied surveillance. And even better, surveillance is now being framed as just how things are on the internet. Just another mosquito on the digital beach. It's fine all of the time. And what else is in the teachers of peaches and privacy breaches? Well, this is already turning into an informational hostage situation. Digital thermostats that will stop updating their software if you refuse to give the parent company your usage data. Apps that conveniently forget to mention by using them in the first place you've tacitly agreed to pass on your blood sugar level or details of a menstrual cycle. How the fuck did we get here. It isn't that different to Abigail Roberson's situation a hundred years ago. The flower company took her physical likeness for profit. Behavioral surplus is the harvesting and commodification of our digital likenesses, our data, our secrets for profit. And if one's response is, well, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Okay, sounds great, but upon uttering that, I hope you'll allow your bathroom door to be removed and to have live streaming thermal cameras installed in whichever room of the house you undertake the majority of your sexy times. Because nothing to hide, nothing to fear, right? Privacy isn't about having somewhere to do drug deals. It's a basic tenet of modern human living. It is the right to be let alone. And we've only just codified it, and we may already be about to lose it. If companies can infer that we're bereaved, or pregnant, or introverted, or just going through one of the many thousands of life crises humans enjoy during their time as sentient meat, well, simultaneously, we know basically nothing about how these companies are collecting and using our data, that is an egregious asymmetry. A full-wave rectified data extraction panopticon, with the sole purpose of commodifying our psychology, of commodifying our secrets. Now, one obvious solution to this is the restating of one's data as one's personal property. The problem with that is that personal property can be sold, can become a commodity, and your privacy and your data are no more a commodity than your right to free association or oxygen. Plus, behavioral surplus isn't just about an individual's data, it's about the data of groups and demographics, and things that can't be personally owned but are terribly useful as data points. But whatever the solution, if we want to steer history away away from this waterfall, it's going to take lots of getting pissed off. And if we don't do something about this, constantly harvesting more and more behavioral surplus to keep the great data mill going will just be what the internet is, because that's how the next generations will grow up with it. Because the model is already a massive part of the digital economy, later it will be the predominant model, and later will be too late. We get to decide now whether this was just a historical blip like the robber barons of the Gilded Age, or the shape of things to come, effectively killing privacy forever. The big brother of surveillance has a little brother called surveillance. Rather than being surveilled from the top down, citizens watch from the bottom up. Dashboard cameras, for example, rebalancing the symmetry of secrets by watching the watchers. And maybe the best fictional extreme of this ever written is a sci-fi novel called The Lights of Other Days. And I'm going to spoil it for you now, since clearly you have nowhere better to be, and secondly, because fuck you. Sometime in the nearest future, a company cracks wormholes. Only the wormholes are too small to send anything through, too small to see even, but you can peek inside. So you can open a wormhole anywhere on the planet and spy 
spy on anyone on the planet without them knowing. And of course, one of the main uses immediately becomes surveilling those more powerful, watching the back rooms of governments and corporations, which makes corruption very difficult. Then things get rather strange, when some genius realizes if you put a time delay on the thing, you can see back into the past, anytime, anywhere. You can't influence the past, because the plot says so, but you can watch anything that ever happened. Things do not go well. Mass outcry, suicides, every terrible thing you've ever said is now immediately available in 4K. People watch their own conceptions, it gets weird. But the next generations to grow up are a bit more relaxed about it all, because the wormhole technology is everywhere. They dress functionally, and for fashion, rather than modesty, because why cover anything everyone has seen already? They have no concept of personal privacy, but as a consolation, they also have no concept of being surveilled by powerful eyes unseen, because the watchers can always be watched. They've replaced the Panopticon with many Panopticons, 8 billion of them. Everyone is a watcher. The story ends with finding out human life was seeded by sentient insectoids, bit left field, but ultimately the wormholes become a very strange way of rebalancing the asymmetry of secrets by abolishing all secrets. And it isn't that much of a stretch to imagine we might face a similar conundrum sometime soon. The smallest camera ever made weighs a gram and is about the size of a grain of sand. The resolution isn't great, 200 by 200 pixels, but that's enough to do some decent spying and it's not like the resolution won't get better. And it's not like this won't soon extend to drones, perhaps the size of gnats with full audio and video capture, and it's not like they won't be mass manufactured and purchasable. Combine that with ever increasing data storage, combine that with whatever brain machine interfaces the next generations will be messing around with, it's not hard to imagine we might build a different kind of panopticon. One in which it's taken for granted that you're probably being watched, that everything you've ever said and done has been recorded and can be accessed by anyone at any time, and that you can do the same at any time to everyone you know. A participatory panopticon. Now, that sounds horrible, obviously, like one long episode of Bling Empire. There will be no escape from every stupid slip of the tongue 20 years ago, potentially from every invasive thought. But the benefit, of course, is that unless the powerful had invisible visibility cloaks, or lived in Faraday cages, they would have to play the game too. No one would be exempt from the participatory panopticon. It's a very strange kind of fair, but a lot more fair than the current mill of asymmetrical secrets we live in at the moment. I don't know man, the road to hell is paved with good inventions. When it comes to panopticons, none is better than one, but one is a lot worse than 8 billion. If technology is going to semi-break privacy anyway, maybe better that it be on our own terms. 500 years ago, there was no way Gutenberg could have known just how game-changing his printing press would be. Likewise, there's no way we can even guess what the internet's great-great-grandchild will look like 500 years from now. Digital telepathy, disembodied human consciousness itself, who knows? But as all inventions do, it will bear the hallmarks of whatever bad habits its parents taught it when it was little. And we are teaching it some very, very bad habits. And whatever it grows up into, it will be us who shaped that, who hopefully taught it that knowledge is power, but spying from ivory towers is rude. Which means it'll also be us who determine the digital landscape our descendants grow up in. And whether or not that landscape is an equitable meadow, or a digitized Victorian mill. Whether enchanted water flows unobstructed through the city. Listening to us, yes, but impartially and replying when asked to convey not only visions of other possible cities and other possible worlds, but showing ourselves to ourselves. Whether that water runs unobstructed through the streets, bringing edification and information, reporting of the distant hopeful and fabulous strange. Whether that water flows down to the estuary and sustains those towering assiduous trees of knowledge we grow over our heads. One great forest network across the refulgent world talking in all languages, of all things, for all time. Such that if interstellar visitors arrived a hundred years from now, and looked down upon the world, and the enchanted water, and the forest we have built, that the forest might be so wise and mighty, they'd mistake the forest for the true steward of the planet. And in many ways, considering how difficult it was to build, and how much it gave us in return for building it, it very well might be.
or whether instead the water is dammed and the estuary drained and wet fog is all that remains of it. Fog that waits with insidious ubiquity in every spot of the house and mind one might once have attempted to go and be alone in. Whether that fog is engineered to no longer speak to us of distant places or possible futures, but only forever listens with a single omnipresent ear to our most private hopes and phobias. Whether the operation becomes so efficient that of a dim evening one can step outside into the grey twilight and look out to the roads which one knows beneath stream all of one's secrets. To look skyward and know one's secrets are being dispatched to ingenious silver birds overhead, whereupon they are blown like pollen across the entire globe, and finally received and consolidated into perfectly ordered data sets in far-flung and enormous halls, where there resides a great kraken. A kraken who does not sleep, who does not tire, and is never full. A kraken who listens of all the dreams and secrets of all those who live in the fog, and lovingly utilizes those dreams and secrets for the production of ever more opulent trinkets and wares. A kraken so saturated in secrets that it considers the currents of the human heart and mind no less manipulable than the diverting of a stream or tilling of a field. A kraken that knows full well if enchanted water only listens, then that isn't an enchantment. That's a curse. That is a fucking hex. Oh yeah, let's hex the water. That's a great idea. The total confiscation of privacy via corporate surveillance. The usurping of human psychology via operant conditioning. The great end of history. Purchased and delivered at the soonest convenience. Whatever you want. Whatever you didn't even know you wanted. The only price being standing epistemically naked before digital gods who remain forever shrouded. And the most diabolical part of it all, that we built a cage for ourselves, not even from some Orwellian will to control, not even from some stupid fear of the other, or terror in face of our own natures, but simply to make a buck. To make a buck! Normally, I would love to play you out with some Carl Sagan rip-off rant about how humans are great and wow, space is really big, etc. But we could screw ourselves over so, so royally with this stuff to the point that the recovery of human dignity becomes impossible, that it might be best not to end this one with any false optimism. So, hope you're doing tip-top. Buh-boy.